So, hello, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to have today here Aubrey de Grey, a uh, thought leader in the field of rejuvenation biotechnology. He has degrees in both IT and biomedical science and originally comes from Cambridge, UK. To my knowledge, he's the first person to put together a comprehensive scientific overview of what categories of damage aging causes and most importantly, concepts, how to individually address them. So I'm doing all these processes of aging. And this was almost exactly 20 years ago, Aubrey, if I'm right. And then in 2013, the world took a bit to catch up. Uh, his concept of the damage categories was validated and published in the High Impact Journal. So hi, Aubrey. Good. Hello there, yes. Great to see you. Likewise. So, yeah, as I said, seven years ago, this was uh, accepted. You know, sometimes people who do not work in this field daily, even in medical sciences or biotech industry, are not fully aware of how quickly this field is evolving and the study of aging has progressed. Um, maybe you can start by giving us a, a very short overview of what, what has been achieved in the recent years. Yeah, it's been a real, um, you know, a real revelation, especially in the past five years, I would say. What has really happened is, um, as you say, it took at least 10 years for the idea of a kind of divide and conquer damage repair approach to aging to become understood and mainstream within the expert community. Um, and once that happened, and once a little bit of progress was made in some of these areas, in various laboratories, of course, including our own at Sense Research Foundation. Um, once that happened, it began to come to the attention of a small number of entrepreneurs, people who had enough vision and enough money to be able to start investing in this space. So the yeah. um, private sector started to emerge, and now we're seeing it exploding really exponentially with hundreds of companies and, very, and an increasing number of investors coming in. And of course, this is making an enormous difference to the speed at which the science is moving forward. For sure, before that time, there was a huge delay being imposed by lack of funding for the critical path research that needed to be done. Yeah, money as usual, yeah. Um, about the same time, um, around 13 or so, there was also something developed that people call epigenetic clocks that seem to accurately measure um, how old an individual biologically is. How, how important is that for the field? I think it's going to make a big difference. Uh, uh, the idea of some kind of biomarker of aging, some kind of thing you could measure that would reasonably accurately predict how long it would be before somebody starts to exhibit the chronic progressive conditions of late life. Uh, that was a kind of holy grail of the field for many, many years. And in fact, the National Institutes of Health spent a lot of money trying to identify such things way back 20, 30 years ago, and they were completely unsuccessful. But with the emergence of big data in biology, of the ability to sequence whole genomes and epigenomes and proteomes and metabolomes and so on, um, this has now become much more practical. And in the early years, maybe six or seven years ago, it was really just an exploratory exercise. But now I think we are getting to the stage where these kind of things can work. Right, yeah. I even heard a provocative statement that now that you can finally measure it, um, it may even be easier to reverse aging than just to slow it down a little bit. Is there something in that um, statement? Oh, Do you very, agree? Much, very much there is, yes. In fact, I've been saying exactly that since the very beginning, since 20 years ago. The key point we have to remember is that when we are re reversing the accumulation of damage in the body, which is what aging is, we are not actually reversing the process. We're not retracing the steps that the body took that created that damage. Rather, we are simply repairing the damage. And that yeah. means we do not necessarily need to understand all that much about the details of how the damage was created in the first place, mm -hmm. which makes it a lot easier, it turns out. 
right? Yeah, that that's really helpful. Yeah, and some people have even achieved to make sales young again. I mean, it started back in 2006 with Yamanaka in Japan, the Nobel Prize in 2012, and now it seems a partial reprogramming has even been done in vivo. Is this a an avenue of research that you would think will be fruit uh, bear fruit in the near future? Well, it's certainly an exciting avenue of research. Uh, I, of course, always try to join the dots all the way to clinical uh, relevance and actual humanitarian benefit. And actually, I'm currently still quite pessimistic with regard to that particular approach in terms of whether it can, in the end, be made to be safe enough. At the moment, we have very promising and encouraging data from the laboratory, from short-lived organisms, especially mice, indicating yeah. that it seems to be possible to make it safe. But the main problem here, and indeed the main problem with interventions that promote regeneration in general, is that they may also promote cancer. And the worst thing is that you probably won't be able to tell whether or not they are promoting cancer. Until, until it's too quite, late. Yeah. Until quite a few years later. Yeah, because what they will promote is the early stages of cancer, which won't actually be clinically relevant for quite a long time. Yeah. yeah. Well, maybe an, another approach that uh, only recently has gained traction, and I follow these as well, is a... Uh, very simple procedure, surprisingly so, called a therapeutic plasma exchange. So you just dilute, if you will, uh, the blood down and take all the uh, small factors out, but give the, uh, the larger ones back. This has resulted in dramatic rejuvenation effects uh, shown by a group in Berkeley, California, and at the same time um, showed improvements in uh, deterioration in Alzheimer's disease recently published and finished a study. This is a very unconventional approach. And I think there the risks are less because you alluded to cancer before. Yeah, it's an extremely exciting area. And it has become exciting to investors as well, if I should come back to what I was saying earlier. In fact, one of the groups that have made the most progress in this area formed a company several years ago, which was recently sold for more than a quarter of a billion dollars. Uh, so, you know, this is something that is really definitely moving forward. I think we should probably, in the grand scheme of things, regard this kind of intervention as a bit of a stopgap, because, after all, the blood is what it is, what cells make it to be. Uh, in other words, what's in the blood is what cells put there and what cells don't take out. And therefore, if we are somehow rejuvenating the blood, then we are kind of... Um, intervening in a pipeline. And the real way, the best way to achieve the same effect would be to rejuvenate the cells that are involved in that process, which is why I do not talk about plasma exchange as one of my seven strands of damage repair. However, in the meantime, before, while we are still not yet able to do comprehensive repair on cells and tissues, doing this kind of rejuvenation of the blood is very powerful. Right, yeah. Uh, I cannot help but mention your book also um, that you wrote uh, 10 years ago and uh, do not want to update because the field is now moving so quickly that it would be outdated as soon uh, as you do, actually. And there you also describe a concept called the longevity escape velocity. Can you maybe briefly explain to our audience what this is about? Certainly. And of course, you're being far too modest because you were the one who translated this book into German. Uh, it was sure. under the title Niemals Alt. Uh, and so if I encourage readers to have a look, especially if you want to understand the details of the science. Actually, the reason I haven't updated it is not really because things are moving too fast. It's rather okay. because the things that are moving so fast are moving in very much the direction that we predicted 13 years ago when we wrote it. And therefore, you know, the concept of standing the test of time, and it doesn't really need much updating. Um, but yes, longevity escape velocity is a concept that I introduced back in 2004 or so. And it is a way to explain why we can expect very dramatic impacts on how long people stay healthy, and therefore, of course, how long people stay alive, even rather soon. 
before the therapies that do this damage repair have become all that perfect. Even if we can do fairly comprehensive damage repair, we will be able to postpone the age at which people become uh, sick from the chronic progressive conditions of late life. And if we can postpone that by even a couple of decades, that will give us time as researchers to make the therapies a bit better and kind of uh, make them capable of re-rejuvenating the same people 20 or 30 years down the road and staying one step ahead of the problem however long we like. The reason, reason why this is so important is because in contrast to, for example, Moore's law and the singularity that people talk about in IT, um, here the problem of staying one step ahead of the problem actually becomes easier as time goes by because there is less damage to repair mm -hmm that we still can't repair, and it's taking longer to reach a pathogenic level. True, yeah. So let's stay healthy to uh, yeah, experience all these breakthroughs. Um, if you would fantasize a little bit, what would you expect in the next decade? What will mankind achieve in the terms of uh, rejuvenation technologies, given the right amount of funding, of course? Right. There are two things I want to emphasize in answering that question. The first one is, I think we will definitely see rejuvenation technologies of most of the types that we need, getting to the point of not only entering clinical trials, but demonstrating efficacy in clinical trials. However, these clinical trials will be for individual specific conditions, not even necessarily conditions of late life at first. Mm -hmm. And That will simply be for proof of concept. What will come after that, and I think probably 10 years from now, it will still be only at an early stage, is combining those therapies so that we can give them all to the same people at the same time and achieve the real jackpot of proper comprehensive rejuvenation. However, the other thing I want to mention that I'm, I feel very sure will happen even within five years from now is okay. a widespread anticipation of this kind of development. At the moment, most of the world is still putting its head in the sand and right. taking the view that this is kind of maybe coming if you're lucky in you know, a century or two, and they themselves are probably going to live only slightly longer than their parents did. But I believe that within a few years from now, the evidence in favor of the rate of progress will be so good that there will be a big, big tipping point where people almost overnight switch to a point of view where they think they're probably going to live an extremely long time, far longer than anyone ever has before, even though in order to do so, they will need to benefit from therapies that do not yet quite exist. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and I do not know any, anyone better than you to judge this. You do really a lot of advocacy on worldwide. So what is currently the higher hurdle for you in a, in a general audience? Demonstrating with data? that undoing aging, undoing the damages is possible, make them believe, yes, it's feasible, or B, getting them to think it should be done, you know, this uh, mental hurdle. So certainly it is difficult to get people to understand or believe that this is either feasible or indeed desirable. And I'm oh. not surprised at that, because the fact is, for since the beginning of civilization, we have had no choice We have had to put this out of our minds to get on with our miserably short lives and not be preoccupied by this terrible thing that's going to happen to us uh, in the future. Right. Uh, so, you know, getting people out of that mindset is inevitably really difficult. But yes, it's happening. And I think, yes, absolutely, every little advance that happens in the uh, science, in people's labs, leads to other experts in the field joining me in publicly making progressively more optimistic statements about what's coming and how soon it's coming. And that ultimately is what's going to change public opinion. Brilliant. Um, we're running out of time. It was a brilliant interview, Aubrey. Thanks a lot for your time. And let's hope that uh, we gain further allies uh, in the next five years, as you said. So maybe even regulators, big pharma and biotech companies. Absolutely. Thanks again. Thanks for your time. <laughs>